Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. The title is Collab Collapsing Waves of a Colliding Past and Future. I would like to speak about a very interesting image that arose to me. For a second, I was contemplating uh, the Red Sea and how, in some sense, uh, through the story of Moses, there, um, through Judaism, we find the waves parting and as the waves part there is an opening and the waves suddenly collapse back so this idea that imagine you wanted to cross a river and the waves of the river went aside and there was a kind of uh what i'm trying to say is like one uh, uh, the direction of one movement uh separates and then it collapses back into itself so what I'm trying to say is that imagine uh, that moment when Moses is walking and the people are following him and Moses is walking between the Red Sea and the waves have parted. That moment when everybody's passed and the waves collapse, that moment, if we took each wave as a metaphor, one side of the wave as, as the past, one side of the wave as the future, just as two waves hit one another and become one elevation, it's as if two different realities merge into one truth. And so I found I'm, I am constantly finding in life a relationship between my objective realm and subjective realm. What that means is certain moments, it's not uh, uh, there. It's like the action is needs to be more internal than external. It's the same with like. I wanted to say it's similar to, for example, how in many moments in friendship, you know, it's like some people sometimes need someone to listen to them. Some people sometimes need someone to talk to them, to tell them things, right? In life, um, a navigation simply means the implementation, the, the expression of one's intelligence through various dimensions. This ability to even consider and conceive dimensions, this ability that we human beings have to separate objective phenomena from itself through a sort of subjective landscape, which is like a lens upon our sight. It's as if uh, when I look at this cup, sure, it's as if I see the cup and I can say then the thought arises. But also when I see the cup, the way the conscious meaning of what this cup is, how it's a cup, is because the subjective lens, it's as if a part of my sight, it's kind of fascinating. It's as if light hits that object, hits my eyes. When it hits my eyes, the light goes through a subjective lens and then back out like playfully in the form of attention to the object. You see, um, just like how there are beams of light, I consider there are beams of attention. I find our attention could potentially be a sophisticated movement of particles that we do not comprehend, particles of uh, the periodic uh, table of a different world, you know. <clears throat> Multidimensionality is a crucial idea. Of course, everything is multidimensional. When you go even open up the dictionary, the words have a, a word can have multiple meanings in accordance to how it's used, the way it's used, the tonality, the intention, the circumstance, where when it's said, where it's said, how it's said, all these are factors. But my interest is taking me to a point where every human being has developed a relationship with their subjective realm in the sense that uh, it's fragmented. So when psychologists speak about a fragmented psyche, I find that's another way of saying the attention of the person is captured and stuck in certain parts of their subjective realm. Now the subjective realm, the ultimate realization from it is that it's your own doing. 
So there is something cool about mysticism that once the person seeks the divine will authentically, they suddenly realize they cannot access it and then they realize their position of authenticity was a subtler ego. So what that means is as the, as the ego, as the illusion uh, amplifies, so does the potential for truth amplify. The more our civilization messes up, the more its success has meaning, <laughs> has value. The fragmentation of the psyche could occur in a way where, <clears throat> let's say a child comes to take a cookie from a cookie jar and the parent shouts, stop that, you know, <laughs> the parent, like the, the figure, is the person in the environment shouts like, don't do it. Or for example, um, something I, I was told later on, for example, um, uh, when I was really young, for example, my aunt had scolded me, but I was so young, I wasn't even conscious, like, do you know, but I was told this, for example. <laughs> <clears throat> and what I mean by that is that to truly care for life, you got to care for the origin of the mind where the experience of phenomenology is occurring and the experience of location is non-local another way of saying it is it's like emptiness is dreaming it's it's something We can say emptiness has, may have an unknown design to it, but nothingness has no design. We, we can see a cup being empty. We can see uh, a system having intelligence and meaning and value. And then suddenly that meaning and value to change and fluctuate and the, uh, kind of like, how can I tell you, as, as, as civilizations rise, you know, in history, uh, every day, the way the human being experiences the civilization rises and falls. You know, if a person is treated uh, dishonorably on this planet, their attention will want to escape it or avoid it. If a person is treated honorably, they will serve the species. And we have to quickly realize that this language simulation, this, this language city that we all live in, it's fascinating for me. There is a reason Ludwig Wittgenstein, this German philosopher, says the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Because for many of us, to, to, the evidence of the world is a co-engagement, it's a co-creation. When, when a being says, I want to see something to make sure it's real, I mean, of course, objectively, yeah, make sure reality is real. But subjectively, you don't have the privilege you don't have the privilege for evidence because it's in the reference points are changing. Who you were yesterday, uh, who you were 10 years ago is different than who you were now. So what that means is it, it, the, the eyes that is checking the evidence is also changing as much as the world where the evidence is found in. You know, to, to even think of reality. This is why some people thought reality was a simulation because the, no, the laws of nature were too static. It's various systems of intelligence functioning in one grand system of unknown intelligence. Knowledge is as alive as there is space for it, and the space of it comes from the unknown. Anytime a human being has an unknown experience, an experience that evokes the new, that brings forth a new archetype, then transformation is a must. You see, transcendence can be as complex as these yogis in the Himalayas kind of sitting down and like the, the transmigrating soul upon a reflection of the ultimate and it becomes too amplified as a 
presence to remain in the body. So these yogis would be found where they would maha samadhi out of their bodies, you know. <clears throat> and that's another way of saying their attention would uh, was was at a point where it was ready to lift off beyond the dualistic dimensions beyond the material plane beyond phenomenology phenomenology is a classroom you know believe it or not as as much as i don't like the metaphor that this planet is an educational planet <clears throat> i i do consider the planet uh, to be a classroom at least the experience of the civilization to be a certain experience i have found myself to pilot in, um, through language and beyond the language threshold through simply simple moments of trust of the experience. It is, an, it is, it is unbelievable how many of us are subjectively experiencing life and how many of us uh, in some sense are aware that there's more than subjective phenomena right now if I tell you what 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 other advanced technology does man have other than language inner technology not an outer technology an inner technology <clears throat> it's simply kind of two modes simply we are either expressing or receiving man is either in, uh, involved in the creation of his truths Or his truths are part of greater creations. I look at this picture I've chosen for this wallpaper, I mean, uh, the picture for this talk, and I don't know what it was about it, but there's something not just about the colors, but about a sort of balance for chaos, as if chaos and order are the children of the momentary attention. There we go, guys. I think I, I have finally found a way uh, to realize that the Abrahamic texts, religion, is a metaphor for consciousness. Now, this metaphor for consciousness, it cannot be proven. There are so many things in this world where their roots are in soil that we cannot penetrate, we cannot dig further. Oh, the eyes of man are limited. The eyes of the species are limited. And what is it doing? Its desires are making it change, chase limitless illusions to a point that I feel if the species keeps going uh, the way it is, at least the majority, it's going to soon want to be a machine. So imagine one day a parent, the child comes home and the child says, I am in some sense like the, the parent sees the child instead of getting a tattoo became a robotic entity. Like the parent would freak out. Emotions rise when the importance of every moment reveals itself. I think what it is, is uh, language is, is a tool. And I, I find there will, of course, obviously, every moment in history, there's new technologies happening, right? <clears throat> but it's just that the, inf the, uh, uh, the mixture of our past, our emotional realities, and our future... I think every action of man simulates a realm. 
with every every word is in its own universe in other words every sound is its own supreme moment when the past and the future collide, the present moment was where all stories began. That's always how it's like, guys. Eyes open, body is animate, Consciousness is spherically sensory aware of its environment and it can choose. It can choose that tension can mature to, uh, towards an awareness of pure stillness and pure movement and pure silence and pure noise. That means I find um, <clears throat> uh, I have seen a lot of different people speak on YouTube, uh, different speakers, you know. And I could tell you the greatest ones were, were those who had found uh, a sort of contentment with the ultimate silence. Well, you know what that means? That means you, get your, you as a human being have an ability to acknowledge all of this phenomenon meaning nothing. And you have an ability <clears throat> to acknowledge all of this meaning something. And so the purpose of the individual archetype is to serve, just like how we don't invent a tool because, uh, 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 for, not out of nowhere, because there is a need for it. And so you, the human being has to consider that who they feel for that day is a need, is a need of their intelligence. It's as if nobody is not intelligent. The species is even wondering if it's all one field or not. What does that mean? That means there is a very tiny chance that behind all of our eyes there is one field of intelligent activity you know many ancient texts point to this the higher dimensions are not a man cannot enter because simply it's not a dual it's it, it's not it's non-dual <laughs> that's why it's like you know if we see in movies the person who finds that secret kind of scroll suddenly his eyes like kind of he can't he, he, he it's like <clears throat> he can't see the truth of another world with these eyes. And so if there is another world, there means there is another self. There is no point in trying to keep the world from changing. The most ultimate service, here's the thing, the mind, the, the body, the human body best thing it can do is build its species. That's pretty common, uh, like pretty direct. Uh, the second thing is that the mind has to begin going through a process where it's seeking a purification of story. When I looked at all the, like, it, it's like when you psychologically analyze what is going on in the mind of a human being in states of fear, in states of guilt, in states of stress, in straight states of turmoil or chaos, what you realize is the free will doesn't feel it can express itself. And what that means, it's, it's an internal denial of authorization. This is when, when, you, when a human being does something that some part of their being feels it was, on, it was wrong, you see you suddenly deny your inner realms. And this is why so many, there were, there's, this, there's groups of philosophers in history who they came out to the world and they said, underneath this animal, there is a good man. <laughs> Behind the eyes of this, like, savage animal that has evolved in history, there is a good man there. <laughs> so the idea is that the, more, the nature of man is good, so once it externally does something wrong, it internally gives itself punishment. And guilt is a way where the mind is not satisfied with the body's performance. It's literally, uh, you can say, any mistake will all will to some degree always create a regret of misuse or misattention 
There's many things that I, there's been many incredible ideas I've had the privilege of being able to grab out of my subjective realm and not like pinpoint, literally my attention, like, um, <clears throat> I've, man I've managed to land a v various ideas, you know, but I can tell you some of the greatest ideas, some of the greatest moments of my life were moments that I knew in that moment, I would never see that moment again. Imagine how you would feel if you had to say goodbye to a loved one and you had to go on a long journey, a journey where you would never see that loved one again, potentially. So it would become a situation where it's as if certain moments of experience on this planet, certain states of my mind were so memorable that it was as if you, had, you have to honor the external and strangely, the inner reality becomes liberated. If you dishonor the external, the inner reality becomes dishonored. Do you see? Because on some level, the mind is telling itself it's all of this. The moment is assuming full, full being of the moment. So you see, the study of consciousness is like we, it's, it's kind of like cornering your ego at, at the edge of time and space, at, at the edge of the corner of time and space, if time and space were like a 90 degree wall, you know? So like at the edge of that corner, it's as if you're taking one of the, your main archetype, the one running the show, you know, the godfather of the mind, the main archetype, the, the, I, where the principal universal philosophy extends out of. <clears throat> because ultimately we are... Uh, separated to various categories in accordance to how our intelligence uh, occurs but it's like we're all the light in the room the future and the past are the shadows of the light of the present moment upon a sort of unknown form what does that mean that means it's kind of like uh, imagine those old school projectors I remember um, when I was in Iran and I was young, uh, my father would take me and my brother and the whole family to uh, to our cottage in Karaj and we would put this projector on this giant wall and we would see, watch the Matrix movies. And it was always fascinating for me to watch the movie Matrix on a projector because it's like, just like how the character is in, in kind of like the Matrix, his reality is like a simulation. It's as if I notice it, that character in the that's being projected on the screen, even if it was conscious, it would never be able to fathom, you know, the intelligence of another dimension projecting it. That means there is a potential that we may never know what's going on on this planet because it's being projected from a dimension out of our observable range. So you see that this is why you have to become playful. This world is not meant purely to be analyzed till the end of time this world is meant to be lived and when we look at living it's like 50 percent of it is known 50 percent of it is unknown what do you do what do you do with the known you can study it and trust it or distrust it but what do you do with the unknown and only you can do one thing you can only trust the unknown because if you distrust the unknown you avoid it the unknown is a great source of liberation. It's, 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 it's something that it's like, um, oh, none of these enlightened, uh, how can I say it? Like a lot of these new age gurus are, are they're um, dancing around the bush. <clears throat> dancing around self-truth. There is no self, ladies and gentlemen. There will come a moment where every individual will see that their eyes are only open when their civilization can still keep, keep standing. That means an effort. That means you have to kind of put down all the stories of life and look at what is here and wonder if this four billion year old science project requires attendance.
there's many emotions that are unwarded. As civilization changes, there's always casualties in any sort of war. And so the change of civilization is a war between the attention of human beings moving from ancient ideas into modern ideas. Now, as the human mind, especially the secular mind, has moved towards modernity, it has come to a state of creativity. This is why Western civilization is the greatest home of the artist. Eastern civilization is the greatest word of um, <clears throat> what I would say the disciplinarian, the person who is so discipline orients the meaning of life, practice and uh, efficient outcome. You know, it's as if like it's, it's kind of um, the world is divided, divided between measurement and endless value. I think Carl Jung definitely had a moment where he was like, after in his no no notoriety and his fame, uh, you know, he probably had a moment where he sat down, looked outside of a window and was like, what am I saying? <laughs> and he realized we, the, it's, it's an infusion. It is, it's as if, the mind of man and the body of man is a marriage of two different dimensions, two different subtleties, as if the brain evolved to a point where it no longer had to see itself as a brain. And what did that mean for the direct experience? We are explorers of everything that is visible. <laughs> I want to read for you a passage from The Art of War, a book by Sun Tzu. He says, if we know the place and the day of the battle, then we can engage even after a march of hundreds of miles. He says, weakness stems from preparing against attack. Strength stems from obliging the enemy to prepare against an attack. There's a passage that says in the art of war where Master Sun said, in war there are nine kinds of ground, scattering ground, light ground, strategic ground, open ground, crossroad ground, heavy ground, intractable ground, enclosed ground, death ground. He says when the feudal lords fight on home territory, that is scattering ground. When an enemy, when an army enters enemy territory, but not deeply, that is light ground. When the ground offers advantage to either side, that is strategic ground. When each side can come and go freely, that is open ground. When the ground borders three states and the first to take it as mastery of the empire, that is crossroad ground. Jesus Christ, this is too strategic. <laughs> I guess I'll leave you off with this from Chang Tzu. Sun Tzu says, war has no constant dynamic, water has no constant form.
That's it for Sansu, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> I find um, it's really about where the attention goes that dictates the human life. And now we're figuring out that the attention can go within and how do we approach the internal dimension? Well, first, the educational system has, has to bring back the concept of mind and the cultural fixation on a sort of uh, solid material realm has to be kind of... We have to look at things pro properly. Civilization can be said uh, to be a place where there's rational activities and irrational activities. Now, the irrational activities come from irrational views. The rational activities come from rational views of the world. The views are coming from the eyes of people. So what is occurring that is that the person is working with an image of themselves and that image of themselves imagines what they can have in a, in a world. Sometimes when I think, I think my desires are in a room that have nothing to do with this reality, do you know? Sometimes I have, I have in some sense had moments where something so intense happened that all, the ego stops playing around. It, this is hilarious, but um, when the soul gets angry, the ego, like a younger brother, just goes to the corner and just is silent. And so what I mean by that is that <clears throat> the truth of the moment must be realized that it, can, it is not conceptual anymore. We are evolving beyond concepts. And what are we evolving to? I mean, of course, I say <laughs> the ship I steer, the ship I pilot is directed towards a, a geometrical language, I think. But I'm not going to bring that too much in this talk. What I'm trying to say is that we have moments where past inspirations and future inspirations collide, collide, you know, and it's like the particle collapses into a remembrance of a wave. Some moments no longer become about the self. That moment where you see that, like the fireman, that firefighter is running into the building, trying to save that other uh, conscious living being, you know. That firefighter doesn't have an ego. That firefighter is like, oh no, it's too hot in the room. And no, the firefighter doesn't even see the failure. The firefighter doesn't have time to fail. Doesn't have time in his, in his subjective realm to consider the outcome. Because wherever your attention goes, guess what? Karma's being like, all right, whatever I... It's like even if karma was like the lords of karma were watching man, you know, man, man is deciding where his attention goes. You are deciding to throw that, uh, pitch that baseball at the, in some sense... <laughs> Pitch the baseball uh, towards the bat, you know. There's a story of the scorpion and this frog, and the scorpion and this frog are friends. <clears throat> and the frog, like this, kind of like, you know, the frog's like, all right, I'm going on a journey. I don't want to stick in this, in, the, in, in this past world. I want to go towards the future. The frog wants to journey across a lake. The scorpion, who is a childhood friend since the beginning it was with this frog, looks at the frog and says, Hey man, I gotta come too. Don't leave me here. <laughs> and so what happens is like, let me let me make it even better, you know. Let me make this even more of an intense story. Imagine this frog and this scorpion were adopted as kids by mother nature 
And so they are brothers. And so these two brothers, in some sense, one of them is going to a different reality. Now the other one says, take me with you. Now the person, uh, the scorpion convinces the frog and the frog's like, all right. The frog says no at first and says, if you sting me, we both die. Right. So it's not uh, like we shouldn't do this. And then the, the person's like, no, um, we, we should do it. You know, the scorpion. The scorpion promises he won't sting and the frog trusts him. And so the frog, the scorpion gets on the back of the frog and they're going. And as they're really close, as they're really close. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make the stories ending playful, you know. So as they're, they're getting really close to land, you know, and the frog's like, oh my God, he kept true to his word. And last second, the frog, he feels a sting, you know. <clears throat> And the frog just looks back, and as the ship it seems to be sinking in that moment, the frog looks at the scorpion. He looks at nature's companion. And he says, how? How could you sting? How could you sting? How could you do this? And the scorpion is in tears and says, because it's my nature. As if he's the scorpion has realized his nature. And hopefully they were, this is why I'm saying the ending's playful, they were close enough to land and so the scorpion can continue and the scorpion carries on the toad and the toad realizes that, um, I don't know, Mother Nature's miracle happens and the toad lives, you know, happy ending. <laughs> The study of nature is very crucial too. I, I tell people the study of nature is not just external. You know, it's like those people who hug trees, guess what? You can hug trees behind your eyes. You can experience values in many ways. It's as if the mind is a container and the ideas in a person's mind are various. It's like a liquid in this container. And as this container moves left and right or whatever way it dances, its ideology also abide by its rhythm. So in other words, how you hold your attention will suggest how the structure, the subjective structure of the world animate. It is becoming of crucial need for our species to study imagination, to study imagination. So what does that mean? That means we are no longer obsessed about finding answers because answers can take our lives away. Answers can occupy our attention in a certain structure. It's as if thinking as if an answer is entering one room. Guess what? There's many rooms. Because I found that in many re re religions, they speak about honesty. But this honesty has to be with oneself. And so it's strange, but the being that abides by his nature, the universe is like, wow, this creature is, is, has realized it's okay for it to be what it is. Rather than endlessly trying to wear shoes that don't even exist yet, you know. <laughs> In the chat section, um, just BBB, um, don't worry, um, the only person who can disturb my talks is myself, so don't worry. <laughs> no one on this planet can disturb my talks, it's only, only I can end them, you know. Um, <clears throat>
when I say what I mean by that is that um, um, the freedom in the creative space is more important than the shape of a certain archetype in the creative space. The, this evolution into a sensitivity to the subjective realm means that the ideas we have on the world stop hiding the actual world. So intuition um, is very important. What, what I think intuition is, what I think all synchronicity is, You know, it's like this kind of phenomenon was happening in the New Age community. I experienced it myself too. But then I realized it's like the mind is so clever, it can build uh, days ahead of what it expects from life before it even experiences it. <clears throat> so when you look for something, believe it or not, the world will show you a lot of stuff because the mind is actually trying to see. But if you desire something that means you want something you don't really know what it is right that's that tends to be a desire we desire the mysterious we desire the unknown you know all, all those people going towards spirituality it's like guess what at some point in your life something unknown happened and that brought forth this vision of what's going on you know so <laughs> It's kind of like the same way an artist or a writer holds a pen. It's kind of like the body is held by the moment, the whole moment's attention. And you can consciously move the pen or you could just, you know, scribble, you know. You could savagely move the pen, disrespectfully move the pen, or you could, you know, honorably move the pen. Carl Jung spoke about archetypes and he spoke about them kind of in, in four major categories. And the archetypes were, of course, whatever he was speaking about must be accessible to the conscious mind. That means if you can't ask the question, there's no... Uh, you can't even fathom the answer. <laughs> He spoke about the persona, where you can think of the idea of yourself being a sort of mask. He spoke about the shadow. The self, the persona, the shadow, and the animus and the anima. These are different archetypes that are required. These are like key archetypes. Pretty much it's like I think Carl Jung was looking at civilization and he's like, all right, what are the basic, what are the main common things that like uh, behave, uh, what are some, arch what are the chosen archetypes in his universe, you know? You can say it's like you can start from somebody like if you take a pen and you make a dot on a single piece of paper, we can call that piece of paper a completed artwork. But you see, it's about how far the simplicity um, through every effort um, branches out, I don't know, into more complexity. I don't know how to say it. 
It's like the simple and complex walk side by side. The mind has an ability to simplify and the mind has an ability to make things complexify, let's say, you know. There was a time I even thought of the mind, if it was treated as a substance, could be found in a solid state, a liquid state, a gas state, you know? So there were times where I thought I could feel as if I am purely material, a solidified consciousness, too solid in the, in, the, in the conscious moment. You know, imagine a more liquefied, flexible consciousness. It's like creative people, I think, are in this area where they're holding on to the known and they're also holding on to the unknown. So their foot, their foot is in both dimensions, you know. So their emotions have a certain range of freedom, and their their emotional self, um, uh, how their attention arises, their emotions has a sort of freedom, and how the attention arises, their subjectivity has a freedom, right? <clears throat> but there were certain practices, especially um, I don't know. I, I I speak of the vision I see. That true yoga did not mean. Self-enlightenment. Self-enlightenment was just a mirror, was a mirror given, was a backup system, the personal enlightenment. It was as if there was no other option. And the evocation of language in, in human civilization was the, for the first time the mirror had a mind. The, mirror could, the mind could generate subjectivity and watch it. some construction drumming happening guys in the background here I think true, seeing, true genius breathes silently. It's uh, <clears throat> the ultimate state is not referential. We can't refer to it as an individual being. We have finally surprised the self into a collective vision. Did the caterpillar have a choice to not become a butterfly? Did the caterpillar's choice even matter once it was in the cocoon? And in the cocoon, the last cells, the last biological cells of the caterpillar die and then the new cells of the butterfly emerge. And I, I thought, what was death but a sort of the same kind of uh, silence and darkness of that cocoon for the caterpillar? The death of the caterpillar was the birth of the butterfly. The death of one dimension is the birth of another. So in order to man to truly reach the pure lands, you have to be able to forgive the world that your mind is being. And realizing that's when the subconscious no longer needs to exist and the unconscious also no longer needs to exist. So no longer the being's attention is conscious, unconscious. It's just moment I am. You know? <clears throat> so anyways, guys, um, I guess I'll end the episode here. Uh, I got to say one thing, I guess, about the subtitle. I, I, I said novelty's torch. That's kind of what I meant by... Like that metaphor of the two waves at the Red Sea kind of collapsing back, you know, it's kind of like the past and future, how the present is that like pathway between the waves of the Red Sea. So it's like novelty's torch. The moment has freedom <clears throat> before image. 
So believe it or not, you're a free being prior to image. So study how your attention is being the moment. There is no greater opportunity. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. Our ancestors were too busy fighting to ask the questions of the mind. This is why it's the task of the future generations to instantly, it's like, think of it this way. <clears throat> it's like, imagine children being noisy. You know, I remember um, when I was in Iran, when I was like very young, like seven or something, uh, before I came to Canada, you know, um, there were these huge family gatherings and it was like, there was a lot of cousins around, you know. And so it's like all of us would sometimes play football or something like that. And it was something where sometimes there would be so much noise that, of course, like our parents would be like, stop, go to the room or something. So what is occurring is that now those kids <clears throat> are and pretty much if the pattern repeats. It's just like a wheel. These kids uh, now suddenly begin to realize the inefficiency of the past must be given its own room and then new rooms. It's as if you don't destroy the old world, you just create another new one, you know? There is a freedom before needing freedom that is simply there. And in the void of the honest experiencer, reality can't hide itself. You see, people think um, there's something strange, even with nature, guys. When you're an honest being and you move in, move in nature, that honesty is like, it's as if nature suddenly, the field of intelligence has a chance to see the being. Sri Ramana Maharshi says, let go what goes. Uh, he says, let come what comes. Let go what goes. See what remains. The awareness is being the self and the self's decisions lead to the awareness. It's, it's, it's uh, advancement. So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. I hope... Um, um, the freedom of a moment to be drawn in a new light never goes away. Much blessings and namaste.